All right, so welcome to the casual Friday. We will be doing programming today in probability, and this is not hot apple cider. Okay, so what I thought I would start first with is a pre-programmed uh, code. We'll talk about it, talk about some of the issues in it, and then talk about how we can change it to do maybe what we want. So you can decide if this is what we want to do. So this is a following game. It's called aces versus fours. Very similar to a game you might have seen before. And so the goal is we have two players and we have a fair deck of cards. All shufflings of the cards are equally likely. And we turn the cards over one at a time. And if you get four aces before your opponent gets four fours, you win. If they get four fours before you get four aces, <coughs> they win. So the best way is to calculate what is the probability one person wins over another. Okay. Without doing any high-level math, what's the answer? 50-50. The game is completely symmetric. Now let's say for some reason I like the number 29. It might be because 29 is prime. I don't know. Uh, so let's say we like 29 and we only want to consider games that end on the 29th move. What's the probability the first person wins? If the game ends at the 29th move. Yes? One half. It's still one half. Each person still has an equal chance. So right now I'm actually writing the program where I am assuming no cards have been assigned. So we have to decide how we want to build our deck. That's the first question and stuff like this. Am I trying to write the most general code possible to investigate anything in the world, or am I going to write a very specific program to investigate what I am concerned with today? Well, for a course like this, it's probably better to write a specific program. If you were to write an application for some company, you would probably want something that would be more general. You would want to have a bunch of procedures and call them into play. So we have a lot of freedom in terms of how we choose our deck. We could have our cards being the ace of spades, ace of hearts, ace of diamonds, ace of clubs, and so on and so on and so on. But all we really care about is the number of these special things. So rather than putting in suits, we can just have the labels as the numbers. And so we could have four ones, four twos, four threes, four fours, and then we'll do 11 for jack, 12 for queen, 13 for king. But we really only care about three aspects. Is it an ace? Is it a f uh, four? Is it not an ace or four? And so it's better to just have three labels. So I'm using one for an ace, 10 for four, and zero for everything else. Now you might think it's a little silly to call a four a 10, but this way, the numbers are well separated. So if I look and I sum how many cards have been shown you know, with these labels, well, anytime it's not an ace and not a four, it's not going to increase my count. If my ones digit is a four, then that means I got four fours. If my tens digit is a four, I must have gotten four. Eight, uh, oh, I guess it's the other way around. If my, tens if my tens digit is a four, I got four fours. If my ones digit is a four, I got four aces. And so I can quickly look and see if I've gotten what I want just by doing a simple count like that. So my deck is I first put in the four ones, and then I put in 10, 10, 10, 10. And then for n goes from 1, n less than equal to 44, n plus plus, so this means increase n by 1, I take deck, which is my list, and I append to deck the number 0. And so it's going to just put in a bunch of zeros until I now have a deck of 52 cards. Count, and you'll see how much I've commented, uh, count is going to just keep track of how often our game ends on the 29th card. Uh, Winsky is Skynet winning, Win John is John winning. And so I'll initialize them to being zero, and then as I go through, I'll keep track of how often does one of them win. So this is the main part of the program. For n goes from one to numdo, and that's what we're going to input, how many times we want to play the game, increment by one, and then we go from this beginning to this end. When I'm programming, I always like to do the begin and end immediately. So if I start a begin, I immediately close it off so that I don't have to worry about having a mismatched bracket at the end. So the first thing is Mathematica has a really nice command to shuffle a deck. It's called random sample. You take your list and you tell it how many things you want to randomly choose from it. Well, let's randomly choose the whole deck. Do I need to randomly sample the whole deck? <coughs> What could I have stopped at? I could have stopped at 29. I only care what's happening. So I could just do a random shuffle of 29. And you could actually see, will that change the runtime? You know, where's the key step? Where are the real costs? 
it's probably going to be a, a small change. Uh, I ran it later with 100 million simulations, and that took me uh, 650 seconds. So then you could run this again and see how much longer would it take, uh, or how much less time would it take if you only randomly sampled 29. There would be a savings. And so I will leave that as an exercise for you to go and see how much do you save. There are a lot of times when if you just spend a little bit of thought, what do I really need to compute, you'll realize it's worth it. All right, so now uh, I'm looking at the 29th card in the shuffle and I'm checking to see if that's greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, I must have picked either an ace or a four, or a four on the 29th card. And if it's not greater than zero, then the game couldn't have ended there. It might have ended early, it might have ended later. I don't care if it ends early or later. So we have really simple ways to determine where we are. We don't have to use that much. We're basically using for loops. We're using if statements. I'm a huge fan of the if statement. All right, so if the card is greater than zero, now we're in some case. I am not trying to find the most efficient, concise coding. I am sure there's a computer scientist here who could write this in two lines if they don't think too hard, and one line if they thought a little bit. Right? That's not the goal. The goal is to be able to look at the code and see what's happening. So now I have this if statement. So I'm going to have a begin and an end for the if statement. Um, and I think that ends down here. I probably should have written end of if statement. So, um, right. So this would be end of if statement for shuffle 29. Okay, and so now we know that our 29th card is either an ace or a four, and we want to see did we win? Well, what must be true for us to win? Yes. We have to have three aces or three fours before. What if I have three aces and three fours? Is that okay? Like on the no, no, no. But before the 29th card, I have three aces and three fours. Is it okay to have both of them? Yeah. Is it okay to have three aces and four fours and then have the 29th card be an ace? No, so we've got to make sure it's not enough to just have three aces or three fours beforehand. We have to make sure we do not have four of either. So I can look at my sum, and so I'm going to let sum be the sum of the first 28 cards. All I have to do is make sure that that sum doesn't have a 4 as a 1's digit or a 4 as a 10's digit. So one thing is, uh, if I look at the sum, I look at the mod of the sum by 10, that just gives me the 1's digit. And I say, that 1's digit better be less than 4, and then if I want my tens digit to be less than 4, I just need to make sure the sum is less than 35. So if these two conditions are true, then it's very easy to see that I have not won earlier. We could do a much longer code where we walk down the line, card by card by card by card, and say, have we won? Have we won? Have we won? Have we won? If you have little kids, that's probably how you would do it. But we can bypass all that and just say, look, let's just look at the sum of the first 28. And so now, if I'm in this situation, then I have not yet won the game. All right, now I'm going to um, increase the count by one as the game ends here. And we can think about, is this right? So does this ensure that the game ends? Yes. Ah, so there could be a mistake in this code, right? We know that we have a ace or a four on our 29th card. So if all we care about is that the 29th card is an ace or a four, we succeed it. We know we haven't won before then, but now we want to make sure that we actually win. Yes. So how would we make sure that there's either three aces or three fours?
Yes. Right. And then see is like the one digit is the one digit like column of four or is it like forty or greater? Okay. So what we can do is now that we know the sum, we can now check and see um, is the sum either having a ones digit of three or a tens digit of three. Right? So what we have is we have this first check over here. We can do this with an or statement. Right? I could try to put this all in one statement over here. Uh, but now you have to worry about where does Mathematica put the parentheses for ors. So what it might be simplest to do is let's just put in another if statement. So um, let's see. This ends. Okay. So we had started something over here. And maybe we only want to continue now if we have a sum that has a ones digit of three or a tens digit of three. So does everyone agree that we need that if we're going to continue? So now what I'll do is I'll put in a new if statement. If, and then I'm going to, uh, so let's see, if mod sum, we've got to be careful. Well, this will be fine. Okay, if mod sum 10 is greater than or equal to 3, or is two vertical lines, or um, sum is greater than or equal to 30, then we begin this if statement, and then we end the if statement. End of if statement that ensures we will win at 29. Yes? Ah. You're still counting the, what I thought, what I was imagining was like, where you would say, if the sum of the first 29 cards. So. Either, um, in that if statement, if the sum of the first 29 cards, um, mod 10, was equal to 4, or if the sum was greater than or equal to 40, of like the first 29 cards. Well, here. That, that means that someone won. So, let's add now. So let's call it new sum will be the sum plus the, plus the card. And now if the new sum is 4 or it's greater than or equal to 40, then we know we've won. Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, thank you. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. So let's see, would that work? So now we take our sum of the first 28 cards and we add the 29th card. And now we check and see, is the ones digit of 4 or does the whole thing sum up to at least 40? So is that now enough to ensure that we win? Oh yes, the second one should be new sum as well. <coughs> and so now we check those two cases. So if either one of them holds, then we go into this place, we'll increase count by 1. And then if our final card was a 1, we increase Skynet by 1. Otherwise, we increase John by 1. And we know one of those two cases is holding because the 29th card is either an ace or a 4. And we'll only increase the count now. Yes? We'll see if all four twos come up between 1 and 28. We have this earlier if that's outside. Right? So we first need the ones digit to be less than four and the tens digit to be less than four. And so one of the things I like about languages like Mathematica is they automatically indent to adjust where you are so you can look and see. So we have the big end loop over here. And then we have a smaller loop inside. This, and all the stuff in this indentation, the 29th card is either an ace or a four. And then over here, 
if we're now inside this, the sum of the first 28, the ones digit is at most a 3 and the tens digit is at most a 3. So when we keep going like this, we keep ourselves in special, special cases. So does this look right now? And now we'll come down here, and this is now just outputting. This is just to print things out nicely. It'll print how many times we actually had uh, the game end, and what percent of the time Skynet won, what percent uh, John won. I'm going to do only a million simulations because I do not want to wait uh, 650 seconds to just watch it run. But let's remember, before it was saying about 14% of the time the game ended. But we had a coding mistake. So let's see what happens now. So about how long should it take to run? Should be about six seconds. But now it's only finishing about 2% of the time. And notice it was taking about six seconds. So a lot of the checks are very short. And if you look at the percentages, they're not too bad. All right. So six seconds isn't too bad. Um, let's do it three million times. So about how long should this take? About 18 seconds. This is why I really like the timing queen. You get some sense. And the question is, do you think that this is a linear problem? Yeah, I'm basically just going through a for loop. I'm just doing it more times. I'm not building longer and longer lists. The longer the list is, the more memory you need, and things will be nonlinear there. So here it took 19.3 seconds. OK, so that's pretty linear. All right. What should we do now? What are we curious to see? Who's dying to know something? Yes? Yeah, so let's see what happens. Now, we should really do this more than just one simulation and comparing the 19.3. I should really have like a timer going now so we can have the suspense of, you know, is it going to be a sizable change? Who thinks it's going to be sizable? You know, at least a second. I'm getting a little worried, though. Whew! 17.9. Got it by more than a second. Do you think it really is a second faster? Or do you think this was just a luck of the draw? No. I'll, I'll, I'll have it running another one as we're waiting right now. What you'd really like to do is you'd like to use much larger numbers. If there's a small difference, the larger size you do, the more you'll begin to see this. I do think that there is a savings, you know, having to only do 29 cards versus 52 in terms of how it goes. Now, maybe the randomness, maybe the last few digits are a little bit easier. Okay, this was 17.8 seconds again. So that's seeming definitely around 18. And if we change the, 92, the 29 to a 52, let's see if that goes back to around 19 seconds. So it's a small savings, but it's not a huge savings. But you know, again, you want to be thinking about stuff like this whenever possible. This is not the problem that was given. What's the difference between this and what was given? Yes? Uh, the problem given had the cards already up. Right. So what we would need to do, okay, so this time it was 19.3 seconds. So I did not cheat, I did not look ahead of time, uh, but my guesstimate of about a second was not so bad. Uh, this is not the problem because we are assuming nothing about the first four cards that are dealt. Well, if we want to assume something about the first four cards, what we could do is we would make a deck of just 48 cards. And we would, fit, we would specify the first four cards, and then we would shuffle the remaining 48. And we would just now do everything just in terms of we need to get three aces or three fours because we can just you know, screw what we've already got. Okay, so I really like a problem like this. It has a lot of the key features we need. It has a bunch of nested statements depending on what case you're in. Uh, for those of you who are taking linear programming, we will learn how to code ands and ors very quickly so that stuff like this can be done in a very nice manner. But these are really nice uh, procedures. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So I thought I would use the rest of the time to do another example or two if people want. If not, I'm happy to give a standard lecture. I've been known to do that. But if there's another code people would like to see, another type of problem, this is your chance. Uh, 
Okay, so I see two people who are about to say something. I, I will just, did I share with you the story of clickers from my differential equations class years ago? So I, you're not supposed to use linear algebra as a prereq, but I can't stand teaching differential equations without linear algebra. So I just wanted to use two by two matrices. And I asked my students, is everybody comfortable with two by two matrices? Silence. Does anybody want a review of two by two matrices? Silence. So we had clickers and I said, I'm not going to report the results to the class. I'm just curious. How many of you would like to see a quick review of two by two matrices? I never promised I wouldn't report the results to other classes. 43% wanted a review of two by two matrices. Not one person was willing to raise their hand. So if you raise your hand and say, I'd like to see something, odds are somebody else, yes. I would like to see an example that doesn't involve vector bars. That does or does not? Does not. Okay, thank you. Anything in particular? Okay. Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah, you want to do the secretary problem? Okay. And I have no bobbies to throw to their deaths. Oh, well. All right. So we will do it as the secretary problem. Uh, numdo will be the number of iterations we will do. So module means uh, I'm an extremely bad programmer at times. I basically say I'm having no local variables. Anything inside the parentheses there are local variables for Mathematica, and they will not be seen by other parts of the notebook. I kind of like things to be seen by other parts of the notebook, but you then have to worry about one variable overriding another. Okay? So one of the things that we have to have as an input is the number of times we want to run this. What else do we have to have as an input? Yes? Uh, the, number of people. the number of people. Any thoughts as to what we should call that? So num people is extremely descriptive. It's a little bit of a pain to type, but Mathematica has tab completion. And so we'll start to recognize things. Now, it's in a different color right now, but maybe once I compile it, it will recognize it. All right, anything else we need as an input? So one possibility is, do we want the program to be flexible where you tell Mathematica where to stop? and you know, finish building a sample, or do you want to predefine it to be the optimal K? My feeling is let's make the program a little bit more flexible and allow us to input that. So we'll call that K. Okay, so success we will initialize to be zero. Now, we could have people uh, for n, well, maybe I'll use p, even though it's not prime. For p equals 1, p less than equal to num people. And see, Mathematica allows me to tab complete. Uh, p plus plus, people equals append to people p. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to be writing all the comments here now. What does this do? Okay. Makes list of people. But it, it does more than just makes a list of people. Our list is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I want to be very careful. I am not trying to be objective on people and assign numbers and say these numbers have meaning. I really just care about relative ordering. This does allow the possibility, I'm sorry, this does not allow the possibility of two people being exactly equal. Are you upset about this? Yes. Right. But I mean, are we willing to say that we will never allow a assignment to have everybody exactly equal? That worst case scenario, we will come up with some kind of arbitrary whim that will you know, lower someone or increase someone by a negligible amount, just so that we don't have to worry about ties. Yes. Yes. Oh. Right. 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 No, no, no. I, I, we, I think we all agree that we want to be in this case. Are we willing to accept this as a society that we can have some kind of whim? No. 
Um, I don't think you should use is somebody a Yankees fan as the whim for the final deciding factor. That should be high up in your list of priorities. It should not be done just as the tiebreak. All right, so now we have a enumerated list of people and each person has a rank. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do our main loop. So our main loop should be for n equals 1, n less than or equal to numdo, n plus plus. And you see they all start the same. This is the begin of the end loop, and then here this is the end of the end loop. End of end loop. Okay. And so you can see as I'm coding, I'm trying to be very careful. I'm always starting and stopping at the same time. It's already done the indenting. Anything I put here is now going to be in the right place. Okay. What's the first thing we should do? Yes. Of what? Well, but right now the people come in in order. Assign, we have to randomize the list. And then what do you consider a good score? So let's say there's 52 people. I've chosen that number completely randomly. This has nothing to do with the deck of cards. So let's say you have 52 people. Is a one a really good person or a really bad person? How many say good? Raise your hand. How many say bad? How many don't know? Yeah, this is the problem. You have to be extremely clear. Um, right now, uh, if you are a math major, you can have five colloquium count as a junior to your requirements as a senior. We were having a discussion years ago. I'm not sure if I can say this on tape. But uh, we were discussing at the end, there's a prize for who goes to the most colloquium. And in previous years, well, only seniors are counted. So do junior colloquium attendants count towards this? And I said, you know, I know it's probably obvious, but are we considering the five junior colloquium as part of this? Half the department, well, of course we are. And half the department, of course we're not. Like, oh, great, we now have to spend time discussing this. It is worthwhile to think, how are you defining things? How are you normalizing things? What choices have you made? And are these the choices others have made? So are we looking for somebody with the highest rank, or are we doing something more like golf and going for the lowest score? So one is the best. So that means we're going to be looking for things that are less rather than first one that's great. So you think about which way you want to code. Do you want to be thinking in terms of less than or do you want to be thinking in terms of greater than? Yes? I think it's more I think it's more intuitive with higher that we're doing this as somehow the value of your worth. You know, this is how many points you have. You can do it both ways. It doesn't really matter. But I will put a little note. The higher the score the better the person. Okay. And so now what we want to do is we want to have a random list. So now we'll have um, the order group will be random sample, uh, people, and then how many do I need to choose? So how large do I want my random sample to be? All of them. So I just numb people, right? Just randomly order them. So now what we want to do is best of k. So now, here's a nice trick, actually. Uh, this is maybe not the best way to code it. The first k is equal to, uh, let's have it well. So we, we, we've got to decide, this is just how we want to program. I want to find the best value in the first k people. One way is to march things down. Uh, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. And, and it's, it's wasteful to create a new list. So best of k, I will initialize it to be 0. It doesn't really matter what I do. And then I'll go for, um, let's say, j equals 1, j less than or equal to k, j plus plus. And then it'll be if order group 
j is greater than best of k, then what do we want to do? Set best of k equal to order group j. And otherwise, we do nothing. End of j loop. So now what we do is we march down. And I started off at 0. I know I'm not going to keep that as my best value. If I want to, I could have started off at negative infinity. Any number less than 1 would work. And now we just march down, and this will give us, in best of k, the value of the best person. So now what do we do? Yes? OK. OK. Oh, but we know the true max. We do. What's the true max? Numb people. Right? Well, no, but what we can do is we can, we can do what you said. We can walk through the list now and go until we get to the first person who is better than best of k. And then just see, does that equal num people? Let's say, let's say there's 100 people. And let's say the best of the first k was 15. And then we find that the first person better than that was 28. We would stop with them. And we would lose because 28 is not 100. Let's say the best of k was 95. And then we go through and uh, the first person we find better than 95 turns out to be 100. We know we won. So you know, if we're looking at things um, as they come in, we are not supposed to know these labels as we're looking at what happens. But do you, do you agree that we only need one loop? Or is that not quite clear? You don't seem, you don't seem fully convinced. Well, what we do is we, we have a ranking of people 1 to 100. And then, we've just, and then we've shuffled them. So they're now in some random order. OK. Right. Now, technically, when we see people in the computer, we actually know their number. We know somebody is 18. And we know that 100 is the best. Well, we're not going to stay with an 18. So what you have to do is you have to remember that if we were actually doing this in real life, we would have a person, but we wouldn't be told their number we would just somehow be able to give them a score and compare them to previous people. But for coding purposes, we can look at it like this. So now what we want to do is we want to march down the rest of the list. The problem is, what if nobody is better? Yeah, we could go all the way to the end of the list and find nobody that's better. What happens? We lose. Right? Doesn't really, we don't have to worry about, should we choose the last person or not? You know, do we spend the rest of our life alone? Doesn't matter. You're a loser. We don't need to really worry about that. So now all we have to do is check and see, is the first person better? The best. So now let's go for j equals k plus 1, j less than or equal to num people, j plus plus. end of j loop. Now we have to be a little bit careful. What if k is actually equal to the number of people? What if my strategy is I'm going to look at the first hundred people and choose the first person better than them? What would happen if we did that? I'm sorry? You wouldn't choose anyone. So if uh, k equals num people, print you are an idiot. OK? And so now, you know, the problem will still run, but we'll be warned not to take into account what's going on here. Right? 
Now, this could be a dangerous statement if we run this many times, because, um, oh no, actually, I put it before the end statement, so it would only print this once. It would not print this, you know, one million times, telling you every single time, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. But you do want to think about this when you're writing a code. You know, who's going to use it, and will they use it properly? Do you have good documentation? You, we, we should say, over here, what the parameters are. Uh, num do is the number of times we play. Num people is number of people. K is where we stop looking to build intuition. And then this way, somebody who's using the program now knows what you're doing. All right, so now J goes from K plus 1 all the way to the end. Okay? And so really, uh, as long as K is less than num people, we'll be fine. And so now we'll go, if uh, order group of J is greater than best of K, so that means we've just found somebody who's better, right? And we only want to do this once, right? So I'm going to have a list of things to do now. End of if statement where found someone better than first k. So what do we want to do if we found somebody that's better? Yeah, so if order group j equals num people, and in Mathematica you have to do a double equals, then success equals success plus one. Okay? Is there anything else we need to do? So there's one more thing I believe we need to do. So we're going through our list, we found somebody who's better, and we check to see if we won. What do we have to do now? We need to, uh, stop. We need to stop. Because otherwise, the way it's written right now is, okay, are you better? Nope. Okay, let's continue. Are you better? Nope. Oh, let's continue. We're not allowed to do that. How can we stop this? We have to somehow stop the for loop. Good. So j equal to num people plus 100. I like to overshoot by a lot. One would be sufficient. But I, I never want to cut things close. Why couldn't I set j equal to two times num people? That would probably work as well, but what if you're in a situation where num people is zero? As a good habit, if you add something to it, it's definitely going to be larger. This will break us out of j loop. Break us out of the j loop. OK. Is that everything we need now? So now I think we just need some theory to print. Print if k approximately equals um, num people over e, expect, and then it would be 100 divided by e, right? Yes? Ah. Should the J equal number plus 100 be outside that second loop? Well, no, because as we're going through the J loop, if our person is better than the best of K, we stop. If they're not better, we keep going. We can only stop if order group J equals the number of people. Is that the only time? Well, j keeps increasing by 1. So what we do is j is going to start at k plus 1, and it's going to go all the way up to num people. And we check and see, is our next person better than the best we've seen? If so, we now consider it a success if they equal num people, and we break the j loop. If they're, if they're not... Oh, oh, okay, sorry. I thought, I thought the j was in that second place. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the j is in this part over here. And so if we are not better, then that means we haven't chosen somebody and we keep going. Okay. 
and now print uh, v1, and then it's going to be 100 times success divided by uh, numdo percent. Okay, and then Oh, wow, it's showing a huge file name. Okay, so this will be marriage. So you always want to save your programs often. I have not been doing that today. That's very bad. All right, so it's now saved. Do we think that this should work? So timing, secretary problem. So we first have to do K and number of people, and number do. So let's do 100 people. Let's do it 1,000 times. And then any thoughts as to what we should take for K? I mean, if you try, try around 36, that should be close to the optimal, maybe 37. So we got around 39% of the time. We could try 20 and see what happens with 20. So 32% of the time. Now let's really bump up the numbers. Let's do 1,000 people. And then what we could do is maybe we'll do the floor of 1,000 divided by E, right? And that should be the optimal. All right, and now instead of doing it 1,000 times, let's do it 100,000 times. Now, another way you could do the program is you could actually give it a little feature so that it, opt, it does the best K. So we could add an extra parameter which says, look, if this parameter is hit, don't even look at what people input as the, best, uh, as the value of K. Just immediately go to the floor of the number of people divided by. All right, so it was only taking, I was thinking about a second before, so this should now take about 100 seconds. So this should take you know, a little bit less than two minutes if things are linear, and this should be roughly linear. And so the question is, how close do you think this should be to the 36.78%? So we're doing it a lot of times. So doing it a lot of times helps. But there's something else that could make it not so great. I'm sorry? So what is we actually did some estimations in the problem, and we could have done a little bit better because we do have only finitely many people. Hopefully that's not going to have a huge impact. But one of the issues is we're only doing 1,000 people, not infinitely many people. A lot of this calculation was in the limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, I would say for all practical purposes, dating 1,000 people, this should be essentially infinite, in, at least in the Purple Valley. Okay. Are there any Seinfeld fans here? There's a beautiful episode where I think it's Jerry and Elena talking about what percent of the population is dateable because they're trying to set up George with one of Elaine's friends. Okay, so it took 101 seconds. So you know, it was about 1.1 seconds before. This is scaling very nicely. Okay, this is what you would expect. And so theory was 36.78. We got 36.66%. That's not bad. Who wants to see a little twist? Let's change it to instead of, uh, right now we have this as equal to num people. Let's make it greater than or equal to num people minus one. We'll consider that a success. And I'll, I'll, I'll do only one tenth, so it takes about 10 seconds. So now, this is if you get either the best or the second best person you win. I think it's going to be around 50%. Now, the question is, of course, is it still the optimal cut? So 50.81%. That's not bad. You, know, you have over a 50% chance. You have a better chance than not of ending up with one of the top two candidates if you do something like this. Now, of course, you could then try to figure out where is the best place to look. You know, do you still want to cut at the same point? 
then you could, you know, there's lots of questions you can ask on this. I'm going to just restore this to what it was before so that it's, you know, saved properly. But, you know, again, I'm always happy to chat with you about coding questions and stuff like this. You know, all we're really doing here is, if you look at a program like this, what do we have? We've got some for statements, we've got some if statements, we've got some comparisons. We're trying to think of what variables do we want. You can use this to get a great sense of what a theoretical answer is. If you're in certain fields, you know, I won't mention computer science or economics by name, you could actually call this a proof. And I've actually seen papers where they have said that, you know, the following has been proven. And I'm like, really? You know, they ran a million simulations. That's not a proof. That's evidence. But, you know, to me, uh, student after student of mine who have graduated and gone to work in quant fields have told me one of the most valuable skills they had was learning to program. They said they did not necessarily appreciate it at the time, but that afterwards it was very useful to be able to just do simple codes like this to investigate. It did not take us that long to write this problem, right? You know, we did this on the order of about 20 minutes. We probably could have done it a little bit faster, but, um, and we could have made it a little bit more concise. So again, if anybody wants to chat more about coding, I'm always happy to do that, or about other material. Uh, the next time we do one of these flips, if we do one of these flips, it would not be for coding. I don't want to do another one on coding. It would be to just do more practice problems. And we only have so many hours in the day. It's an interesting question as to how do we want to optimize this across things. We've got about two minutes left, so I will just end with a statement on what a convolution is. Um, should have left a piece of chalk in the middle so it's not tracking me. Is the camera too high now to see on the board? Do we need to lower it a little bit? Okay, so convolution. Let's say x and y are independent random variables. We can make a new random variable z, which is x plus y. And the name of the game is, if I understand the densities of x and y, do I understand the density of z? And it turns out there's a very nice formula. The density of z is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the density of x at t and then the density of y at z minus t. And t is our dummy variable that goes from minus infinity to infinity. If you think about what's going on, I want to take a value of x to be t, and then the value of y has to be exactly what I need so that the two of them sum to z. The way you would prove this is you would look at the cumulative distribution function of z. This is the probability that z is less than or equal to little z. This would be the integral um, x goes from minus infinity to infinity, the integral y goes from minus infinity. How high can y go if I want x plus y to be at most little z? Given that I fixed x, what's the largest y could be? z minus x. And then I would have the density of x and the density of y um, dy dx. In this case, I'm assuming x and y are independent. All right? So the density function splits. Now if I want to do this, if I integrate this y function by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I would get the integral x goes from minus infinity to infinity, fx of x, and then I would get the antiderivative, whatever that is, at z minus x. I don't have to worry about the antiderivative at minus infinity because that's zero. This is the cumulative distribution function. Am I still focused? Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so this is the... All right. And so we now have our density function over here. And now we just take the derivative. And if we take the derivative, we get the density function is just the integral uh, minus infinity to infinity of fx of x, fy of z minus x dx. And the only difference is now I'm using x as a dummy variable and not t. 
I'm assuming I can pass the derivative in front of the integral sign because I've taken real analysis. Okay? You have to justify this. This is why we have classes like real analysis. All right, so this is a good place to end. There's far more on this on the book and in the video online. Always happy to chat.